I mean, know all of you that it will take place between the 25th and the 27th, or all in this uh, time in the afternoon. So we will be together for three days. And when we thought about which kind of a structure we would like for this uh, webinar week, we thought in three different days, three different sessions. So that's what we thought. And that this is the structure we will have for the uh, next three days. The first three days, we thought about looking deeper into the topic, into blended learning. And for that, we will have two great experts. Uh, well, now I will introduce um, Steve Wheeler uh, after that. And um, I think it, it would be a, a very good point to for starting this, uh, this blended learning week. The second day, we are going to have four uh, participants um, explaining good practices uh, in blended learning in their universities and institutions. And on the third day, we will have a panel discussion with three great discussants. Um, Steve Wheeler will be with us uh, again, and also, as you see, Antonio Maria Teixeira from Alberto of Portugal, and Stefan Polmans from Leuven. So in this last session, and after these two days, we would like to discuss about the present and future of learning, learning with some main questions um, I will pose to the um, discussants. And we will have, I, I think, a, a very lively uh, session. That's what I hope. So uh, I want to introduce first to uh, Steve Wheeler from Plymouth University. And I would really thank you for thank him for being here with us, for accepting to participate in, in this Empower webinar sessions. Because I, well, I found him in, in Portugal very recently, and I really enjoy very much that lovely and lively uh, session we had there. So uh, I asked him to participate, and I'm hoping you will enjoy also as much as I did in, in Portugal. So he's a consultant, and he has worked with a number, as you can see, of high-profile organizations to support uh, all kinds of innovations. He is, a, I think, a very innovative and creative person. The uh, title is in the mix, and uh, he regularly also he's a very well-known keynote speaker. And he has just recently uh, well edited a book, and you may mention. And so uh, I will give you the floor, uh, Steve, and after you finish, I will introduce the uh, wheel. So I will close my video and my audio just to give you uh, the main role. And thank you again. Thank you, Angelus. It's a very, very um, grace, graceful introduction to me there. I, I hardly recognize myself. But um, hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK? Can you um, put a thumbs up or um, say, say something? Yes, that's great. And I'm hoping you can see me and um, see my slides as well. That's always a, a consideration when you're doing this kind of thing, isn't it? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sat here in, um, in sunny Plymouth. It's very warm here in the southwest of England, in a seaside town. In my office, this is my, my uh, personal library behind me here. You can do that kind of thing when you're retired. I, I used to work at Plymouth University. I'm still a visiting research fellow there, but now I'm also um, I'm, I'm working no more than one hour every month or so, and the rest of the time I can do what I want. So uh, I do a lot of research now and a lot of traveling. Just come back from Bruges, where I keynoted the Eden Conference this week, uh, just gone. And um, before that, I was in Ireland, so I get around a bit. It's good fun. And today, um, as Angela says, I've been asked to talk about um, blended learning. I thought I'd provide you with a critical view of blended learning, because um, it's an interesting subject to talk about. Um, from my own background, having been involved in learning technology for the past, what, 43 years now, that's a long time, isn't it? It's like two lifetimes <laughs> or two present sentences. Um, I, I've seen a lot of changes in that time. And um, and I'm, I'm kind of um, and under the impression now that actually blended learning doesn't exist. How about that? It, it's, it's always been there, and we've just given it a name. Uh, because ever since the, the time when we first um, created our first portable device which was known as the book um, from then onwards we, we've been able to move around and learn and as well as sitting in classrooms so for me blended learning is just a new name for something we've been doing for many many centuries now and um, so let me just elaborate on that a bit uh, I'll elaborate on the history of what I've been doing as well that's my contact details there if you're on Twitter then you can find me on Twitter with that handle there's Steve Wheeler um, and uh, 
really my first question for you is is what do you think is in the blend what what, what is blended learning for you i'm going to tell you what i think it is for me but then um, I guess I'd like to hear from you as well about what you think blended learning is, because it means different things to different people. It's like um, getting a mobile device. You know, I've, I've got my um, Galaxy Sam, um, Samsung Galaxy here. Um, we all use them differently for different things. And uh, we can talk about mobile learning as one of the blends. And, and really, that has many, many different um, interpretations about what it really is. So what is in the blend? What would you consider to be blended learning? Would you, you recognize it if it sat up and said hello to you? So back in around about um, 1983, I was working as a manager in the National Health Service, and we were tasked with training nurses. And along comes this lovely device, the BBC computer, and I'm sure um, People have seen these before. If, if you're old enough to remember one, this was one of the first microcomputers. And we introduced something then called flexible open learning. Up until that point, nurses were brought into the classroom and uh, or into the um, a fake ward that we had at the time, a kind of simulated ward with beds in it and, and dummies for patients. And um, they would be taught directly by the teachers. But when I introduced computers in 1983, we created some small programs for the students to be able to use so they could self-instruct, so they could learn on their own, at their own pace, and in a place where the computer was. So it was still tethered, but at least they could move away from the classroom. And this, I guess, was a technological innovation because what it did was it placed the teacher to the side. It placed them away from the students, and then the students were able to actually create their own learning environment. I'll sorry about the phone. Someone else will pick that up in a minute. But um, so what happened next was we started to innovate with various other tools and technologies. Hello. And um, okay, they'll come back. <laughs> and um, and what happened was um, they, they they started to create their own timelines, their own schedules for learning as well. And interestingly, when a few years later, in, in 1989, this gentleman, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, invented or, or introduced something known as the World Wide Web. We started to see that expanding even farther. We started to see that branching out in all directions and all sorts of new innovations coming in, which created new environments for, for students and for, for teachers as well, of course, to create things in. So that was a real, um, I think, um, turning point for us all in, in, in terms of the history of distance education in terms of the history of technology supported learning. It was a, a real kind of point of, of um, reckoning where things started to change rapidly. And then um, in 1995, I graduated from this university, the University of uh, the Second Chance, as they call it. Um, I, I guess um, you would know it better as the British Open University. I did a degree in psychology, though. I did it over three years. Again, I did it because I didn't want to give up my job. I had a wife and three kids. Um, a mortgage to support. And so um, I thought I'm not going to be able to give my job up to do um, my, what I wanted to do, which was to study for a degree in psychology. So I went um, and enrolled with the Open University. And I did most of my de degree in what you would, I, I suppose, consider to be a flexible open way or what they now call blended learning, because I didn't actually attend the Open University itself. I did most of my study at home or on the bus or um, in my office or uh, out, out on the lawn in the summer. And then we would meet occasionally with local tutors at the local uh, education center down the road here. And also, once every year at summer, I would go away for one week to a, a, a traditional university and we would learn face to face uh, for, for, for a whole week and, and do all sorts of experiments. And I did that for three years and I got a, a great degree at the end of it. And um, it was it's considered now obviously the open university is considered to be one of the best university systems in the world so whatever open university you go to whether it's um uned in in, in spain or, or um you know there's there's uh, the fern universitat in germany and there's lots, lots of open universities around the world that, that kind of compare to it um the british open university has now uh, recently celebrated 50 years of operation and that's an incredible feat so this is all what I would consider to be a form of blended learning. But if you want to 
look into this in a critical way. Let's start looking at okay, this is was meant to come up one, two, three, four, five, six, but because it's all in one place, the uh, transitions have, have gone for some reason, lost in translation. What I'll try and do is explain this to you in, in, in some detail. I see um, the traditional um, methods on the left hand side and the contemporary or, or modern methods on the right hand side. And face to face would always have been until it came to the point where um, I suppose someone like, um, oops, I've lost my slides. Who's been playing with my slides? Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the distance learning um, method, as it's known really, I suppose, first came into being around about 1840 with Isaac Pittman when he uh, took advantage of the, um, the penny uh, post system in the United Kingdom. But I, I would suggest to you that actually distance education goes back a lot farther. The correspondence course, as we call it, goes back a lot farther than that. And um, I'll, I'll leave you to guess for a few minutes as to when the first correspondence course was. And maybe um, if you've got room to type, you may, maybe type something up um, and, and give me your answers. And I'll come back to that question. But uh, we go from local to remote in that sense. But we also now go from tethered or in, in, the, in one single place education to mobile any, any place learning now as well with the technologies that we've got. So the technologies are actually making blended learning more visible in terms of what we can achieve with it. Um, nobody's answering the question yet. You, I, is, is it possible for people to have access to that um, texting there? When was the first distance education uh, course or when was the first correspondence course? That's the question. We're also moving from analog to digital in a big way. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of all of these as we go through um, this, this presentation. But um, the other interesting blend, I think, is, is synchronous to asynchronous. So we're moving away from face to face where everyone's in the same place to remote. And also we're, we're shifting the time when you can respond to questions or, or interact with each other as well, which gives a lot more time for reflection, for example, for critical analysis and reflection. And uh, I've been using all of these methods and these modes, mixed modes uh, around um, the universities that I've been teaching in over the past few years. Here's the real big one for you to grab hold of. We're moving from teacher-led to student-led. Um, so we're, students are becoming more autonomous. They're becoming more able to choose when and where and how they learn. And with the massive open online courses that we've seen recently, especially the CMOOCs, the connectivist MOOCs, the early ones, they were even um, assessing themselves or getting others to assess them in a form that they wanted to be assessed in. So that's a real sea changer. And um, the final one, individual uh, versus collaborative, that's another mix that I'd like us to consider because um, students can learn on their own quite easily, but they can also learn in collaborative ways now using um, a variety of tools and technologies, different environments and different methods as well. So. There's quite a mix of different types of blended learning that we can talk about here. And Fred, um, 1900 is a good guess, but it goes back a lot farther than that. Um, anyone else want to have a guess? Or shall I put you out of your misery? For me, the first correspondent, Paul the Apostle, was in prison uh, in Rome, in ancient Rome, around about AD 30, AD 40, something like that. And he was writing to the early church, and it was taken by couriers. It was only a one-way kind of um, you know, instructional method, but for me, that was the first um, distance learning or correspondence course because uh, he was separated from the people he was teaching by a whole lot of bars and by distance, and the couriers were the technology of the time, and they ran with the letters to the various churches that he'd set up. So that's an interesting one. So we've got a long history of this. And like I said before, I think blended learning is, a, is the latest name that we've given, given to um, what we've been doing for a long, long time. Now we have more ways of doing it. Here's the idea of untetheredness. Here, here's where I used to walk up to work up that street on the left there. And um, there'd be a telephone box. I don't know if you've seen the British telephone boxes, these red boxes that have been around for centuries, some of them. Well, a long time anyway. Not centuries, but certainly decades. Um, I noticed this um, barrier that had been put around this telephone. So I thought, I'll take a picture of that because something interesting is going to happen to, to this. And then three days later, I came back and I saw that. And this is a trend that's happening now very much, uh, I think. We're still using um, tools like this to communicate um, you know, this way 
as a telephone. Um, but I think the tethered telephones are starting to disappear. There are still many around, but there are a lot less than there used to be. And even someone like my father-in-law, who's now um, in his um, 80s, he actually got rid of his house phone recently. I haven't, as you can tell, as it rang earlier on. But he got rid of his, his uh, tethering, and now he only uses his mobile phone. Um, so this is not just a generational thing. This is happening across the generations. It's a huge trend, and I think as educators, we need to be aware of the uh, um, influences of this, this factor and the possibilities of this factor and also the consequences of this factor. So moving along again, I'm going to rush through some of these slides. We have a mobile culture, and I took this photograph a couple of years ago, and that little yellow circle was meant to come up in a minute to, to identify for you. And as you can see, that everyone there has their earbuds in, everyone there is zoned out, everyone is looking at a little screen, except one person. He is reading a magazine, a paper-based magazine, and that's interesting. I, I find that... Um, they stand out now um, as different because they are using what I would consider a retrograde or a retro um, method of, 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 uh, of learning or, in this case, um, finding information. Um, the rest, goodness knows what they're doing. They may be listening to music. They may be um, uh, talking to someone on, on the phone. They may be um, reading from a website. They may be listening to an audio book. They may be playing games. There's a whole range of things you can do, obviously, with the mobile phone now that you can't do with a magazine. <laughs> with a magazine, all you can do is get information from it. With the others, you can do much more. So this is why I think now we're on the edge of quite um, an evolution, the next step, if you like, in education. And we've been in that kind of mode for the last what, five or six years with the proliferation of smartphones. And that's an interesting time for us all. Here's an interesting um, option that students have. They, they take notes using them. Uh, this is some students in a class very similar to one of mine. Um, and I used to see this all the time, students grabbing images, capturing images. They didn't necessarily stand up. They weren't that polite. They'd just sit in the back and click, you know. Um, as you've seen also probably in conferences that you've attended where people have interesting slides on the screen, click. And my students um, were very adept at, at using these tools even 10, 15 years ago. Um, but um, my, my colleagues would say to me, look, that's not learning. I'd say, no, not necessarily. but what they do next is, because what they do next is important. What do they do with the image next? They reflect on it. Maybe they use it for uh, in a blog post. Maybe they share it. Maybe they edit it or, or um, uh, crop it in some way. Maybe they um, take the, the, the words that they've seen and maybe um, expand on. There's a whole range of things they can do. And it's what they do next. The gateway, if you like, is opened at that point. So I see these tools as gateways into deeper learning gateways into deeper learning. I'll emphasize that point, and I'll come back to that later. Um, the other idea that I want to pose you is that we are all members now of a digital tribe, or digital tribes, should I say, plural, because there are lots of different um, um, totems out there which we can gather around, and, and we can swap very quickly between them. And each totem, each digital totem, has different behaviors associated with it that are acceptable and, and, and looked for. But generally speaking, we identify ourselves through the digital um, mediation of our of our communication. And in that way, that becomes, I suppose, what Bourdieu would have called cultural capital. But it's digital cultural capital. And, um, and I'd, I'd be interested in your views on that kind of idea. Um, so young people are very much identified, and so are older people now, as I've said, by... Um, the idea of using their mobile phones as, as part of their identity, an extension of themselves, maybe an extension of their minds, of their thoughts, their memory. And, and obviously, they're, they're, um, they are dexterous in using them as well. Now, we call it one-thumb signaling, don't we? I think Howard Rheingold talked about one-thumb signaling. So this is the culture that we're living in now. This, this is what you know blended learning kind of sits upon. And... Um, <laughs> This is a throwaway comment. You know, if, cat, if cats could um, text, that they wouldn't because you know, they, they don't communicate, but not with us anyway. But um, we communicate with each other, so therefore we are adept at using those tools to communicate. And for me, the social media tools that we use and all the other tools that we use give us a voice in the community, and that's really important for everybody, I think. To uh, When we talk about, you know, 
widening participation and we talk about inclusivity and we talk about giving everyone a voice, this is where it starts to happen, I think. And uh, obviously it has to be managed effectively, but I think um, we're, we're, we're sitting on, on the edge of something really important here. And Tim O'Reilly called it the arch architecture of participation, the idea of web two, as, we, as, as he called it, the, the, the kind of second iteration of the web, the social web, having all of these tools and technologies, which ultimately lead us to generate our own comment, our, our own content. So user generated content is becoming increasingly important in higher education now. Um, I did a, a project with uh, a European funded project several years ago, now, about eight, seven or eight years ago, um, called Concede, which investigated the quality, the assurance of user generated content. And it was quite a minefield. We opened up a whole range of different areas of, uh, of, of discussion and, and, and debate around what is user generated content and how important is it. Um, students will go to Wikipedia as their first port of call, for instance. That's user generated content. But how do we verify the quality of it? Well, there are lots of ways of doing that. And as we go through this, we will start to discuss some of them. And the other point I want to make is that we live in very social environments. We are social animals. We, we kind of seek connections with each other and we seek communication with each other. So can you imagine this family here in 1950, they're actually watching a television set. It's a family. Um, uh, a father and a mother and a boy and a girl and they're all gathered around this little totem and they're all sat there watching the same channel there's not much choice because guess what the guy on the right hand side has the remote control the father is controlling what's being seen and it's probably not much to watch anyway in the 1950s probably two or three channels at the most but if we then fast forward to today we are family becomes we are family and here you see a similar type of family um, and they're, they're patently looking at a, at a big screen, like a television. And, um, but now it's changed because although they're still in a social context, a rich social environment, they now have personal choices because each of them in their hand has a personal device. And they can control their part of the screen and they, control, they can control what happens on the screen. It's still very social, but it's also now intimately personal as well. And this is why I think digital devices, personal devices, are becoming increasingly important in um, higher education today. There are four possible learning theories that we can discuss here around this. So for instance, uh, learning by listening is instructionism, as we call it, behaviorist kind of approaches. It was the very first form of teaching that we saw. Learning by doing, um, what I would call uh, constructivism, um, coming from the work of Piaget and Vygotsky and people like this, um, I think um, became very, very popular in the, in the 60s and 70s, and it's still increasingly popular now, social con constructivism in particular. Learning by making, which is Seymour Papert's twist on Vygotsky's work, learning through constructing and making things and problem solving through that, that that's becoming important but there's also a fourth um, theory now which we have to consider in the digital age and that is learning by sharing which is otherwise known as connectivism this is the work of people like Stephen Downs and George um, Siemens and people like uh, Dave Cormier or Canadian academics and I'm going to kind of strip these to pieces and try and put them back in terms of, of blended learning for you so learning by listening is the first one and we see this traditionally in every higher education uh, university. Even today, you see large lecture rooms or, or big rooms with lots of long lines of tables and chairs. And everyone sits and listens while the guy at the front, who's the expert, holds forth and tells you what he knows. And tr he tries to transfer his information from his brain into yours. A bit like what, what I'm doing now, I suppose, really. And um, th if they're lucky, they may get some discussion or a seminar out of it. Now, we can actually adjust this to make it much more dynamic and engaging by introducing personal devices. This is some of my students here from a few years back listening to one of my colleagues talk and I took a picture at the back and each of these students either has a mobile phone or a laptop opened in front of them and they can drill down deeper through these personal windows that they have. They can drill down deeper into what the lecturer is saying and maybe ask what if questions and maybe say is that right you know can I go farther in this and they can take it in any direction they want from that point. It's another gateway technology. 
So that's important. Um, but learning by doing, um, learning, putting your hands on something, you know, getting your hands dirty, as we say in England, that's important as well, as is learning by solving problems because it engages the higher cognitive processes. So all of these engage learners in more detail. And learning by making, here's three of my students from a few years back. They're, um, they're actually creating a stop-go animation video of a theory. I didn't ask them to do this. They did it because they wanted to make more sense of what they were learning from me. So I gave them time to go off and create some kind of context behind what they were doing. So this, these, are all, because these could all be considered to be blended forms of learning because I'm not necessarily present all the time as the teacher. They have the, the context. It moves for them. It changes according to the technologies that they're using. Um, now, here's the big question for you. Blended learning, is it teacher-led or student-led or both or neither? Could it be community-led? Could community be the curriculum? I don't know. But this is something we all have to determine depending on the organization we're working within. But um, I'm often met by this in um, when I give lectures. You know, a whole group of people all lined up behind in front of me and and I have to try and um, make sense of something for them, and they have to listen and try and make sense of it too. And I was down in a university in um, New Zealand not so long back, and um, I was down there for a two-week residency as a, as a visiting scholar. And they asked me to solve some problems for them, and one group of um, uh, anatomy and physiologists came in. Um, they were teaching um, students, uh, anatomy and physiology and, and basic stuff, but um, they were doing it via lecture. And I said, well, how many students have you got? They said, 3,000. I said, how do, you, how do you manage that? They said, we have, we have 10 groups of 300, because we, we only have lectures, that, lecture theatres that, that cope with 300 students. So, you know, 300 times 10, 3,000 students. And I said, so <laughs> how many students do you get there the second week then? It's all oh, about half that. And then and it tails off until there's hardly anyone left coming. And I said, well, and you're still continuing doing lectures. They said, yeah, we have to get the, all this content into their heads. And I said, well, have you considered other approaches, you know, blended methods or, or, or methods where they have to go off and do things to engage them more? And they said, well, such as. I said, well, how about this idea? Um, um, because learning is in the struggle. You've got to make them struggle. Yeah, don't just feed them the information and say, okay, now you've learned it. Make them struggle to find the answers. Make them struggle to solve problems. Make, give them challenges. So here's a challenge for them. How about an ungoogleable question? And they said, is there such a thing? I said, well, there is now. <laughs> so uh, they said, well, what, what are, you know, are there such things as ungoogleable questions? You know, is there something you can't Google? I said, yeah, of course there is. There's loads of things you, can, that you can't Google, things that, that aren't on Google, things that aren't available readily on the web, not searchable. And they said, well, give me an example then. I said, well, I'll give you an example that's um, what is there exactly five of five? Um, you know, five. Here we are. What is there exactly five of in the normal human body? And they said, easy. It's fingers. I said, no. Nope. You've got eight fingers. And if you, you if you count all the digits, but it's not five. Normal human body. And then, so they had other things. Like senses. I said, no. There's more than more than five senses. And eventually they gave up and they started googling it themselves and they couldn't find anything. And at the end, I said to them, right, the answer is five lobes of the lung. There's, 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 um, there's two on this side and three on this side. We're asymmetric. And they went, oh, of course. I said, but no, that's a gateway question. Back to the gateway again. This takes you down another road now and asks the students to struggle about the answer and about what they're trying to learn. The, the, the question is, why are we lopsided? Why is there only two on one side and three on the other? And they said, well, it's because the heart's slightly inclined to the left. It pushes, you know. I said, yeah, but why is the heart slightly inclined to the left? And then on it went from there, and it went down into the really deep critical stuff. And I said, that's the kind of stuff that you should be doing with your students. Don't lecture them. Give them some information, but then ask them to go away and find out for themselves. That's a blended approach, if you like. Um, and there are lots of ways of interpreting this. So. Uh, Vygotsky's um, zone of proximal development and Bruner's scaffolding, instructional scaffold, scaffolding that came from that, are all based on this idea that there are three zones of learning, that there's what you can learn on your own, what you can learn with the help of someone else, and stuff, stuff that's beyond your reach right now. And the ZPD itself is normally supported and scaffolded by knowledgeable others, correct? Yeah. But I'm su suggesting now that actually tools and technology 
can also scaffold that process. You don't have to have teachers there necessarily. You just have to have the artifacts there which teachers and experts have created. So here's an example of that. This guy here, a guy called Julius Jaeger, who was the gold medal um, winner in the, uh, for the javelin in the World Championships in 2015. He went on to Rio de Janeiro in the Olympics in 2016 and won a silver medal. So he's a pretty decent uh, javelin thrower. How did he learn? He didn't have a coach. He learned through watching YouTube videos. He learned through watching videos of people like Jan Zelezny and Steve Backley and all the great champions. He just copied their techniques and that's how he became so good. So that just shows you that actually the digital scaffolding idea can work because you don't necessarily have to have coaches and teachers present all the time. So this is an example of how blended learning, as we now call it, is, is, is quite powerful because it gives the student autonomy and it gives the, the onus is on them to learn for themselves. So really today's learners, um, if it's going to work, they have to be more self-directed. They have to be, um, I suppose, inclined to collaborate as well, but they also have to be the nodes of their own production. They have to create that content themselves as well and share it. And be, um, it has to be important for them, I think. And uh, that's why I think blogging is such a powerful um, method of, of critical um, thinking because it, it makes students think more about the audience that they have. It raises their game. They have to kind of think more carefully about how they reference things and how they look about you know things like copyright of images and, and videos and things like that so but it also allows them to kind of i think become more succinct and, and they, they're more careful about what they write and how they express themselves and make their arguments so there's a whole range of things around this that are important because ultimately um it's not about um the teacher and the student it's about the student and how they relate to everybody including the teacher the student is the one that does the learning so uh, a new theory that's emerging in recent years is paragogy, which is Corneli and Danoff. And the idea behind this is that um, it's about peer learning, peer instruction. Um, the premise is that everyone knows something, but no one knows everything. So we can all teach each other. Um, and we can also teach the teacher as well, if that makes sense. So students can teach teachers. And I, I, again, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, because when we talk about flipping the classroom, which I think, I think is the kind of the modern way of saying blended learning um, you know the idea that, that, that Sams and Bergman have come up with um, the term flipping the classroom where you actually do the hard stuff in the classroom with the expert and the easier stuff the instructional stuff is now hived off into video forms and then web-based forms at home so the student is prepared before they come into the classroom to discuss the deeper issues with the expert now that's all well and good uh, but can we go a step further with that well, I gave you a clue earlier on. Yes, we can. So I, I suggest that we actually flip the teacher as well as the class. Now, I would have got in trouble with that years ago if I'd said in school, yeah, let's flip the teacher because that sounds rude, doesn't it? But actually, when I talk about flipping the teacher, I mean flipping the role of the teacher. So what I would say to my students is this. OK, here's the knowledge you've got so far. Go away and learn some more so that you can come back and teach me something I don't know. And I'll be your awkward student. I will ask the difficult questions. And you are then, you have to be prepared to defend your answers to me. And so this is what we would do. I, I called it bear pit pedagogy because it was like bears being set upon each other in, 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 a, in a pit. A very cruel idea. But, but that was the idea behind it was that there would be lots of arguments and lots of heated discussion about what is meant by this and, and how do we argue that and how do we prove this or have evidence for this and so on. So we flipped the teacher as well as the classroom. And that, for me, I think is the ultimate type of blended learning because it means that students have to go away and grab stuff that, that is new to them, and then they have to struggle with it. And they have to create their own gateways through into this knowledge, through the technologies. Then they have to come back and argue with an expert. And I think, for me, that was the ultimate challenge for my students, especially in their, in their final year. It's all making sense to you, is it? Because we learn by teaching. Latin, descendedissimus, we learn through teaching each other. If you can't teach it, you certainly haven't learnt it. So I think that's an important idea for all of us to grasp in this kind of age of, of blended. The idea of self-organised learning is, is not the same as self-determined learning or hurtagogy, which um, Hayes and Kenyon have come up with as their theory, but it's, it's certainly got these six key elements to it, you know, communication and reflection, collaboration, community, 
um, creative actions using tools, and then disseminating, amplifying those ideas further afield. That, for me, is what um, self-organized learning looks like in the, um, in the digital age. And I'm watching the clock here. It's also, I think, about self-organized learning environments. Sagata Mitra came up with this idea originally that if students are given the tools and they're given access to knowledge, they will tend to learn for themselves. But they'll learn better when they're in groups than if they're on their own because there's an element of collaboration, cooperation, and support that's in there. So the peer support, I think, is going to be increasingly important in blended learning. Um, and then another theory that's emerging to kind of talk about here is rhizomatic theory, where um, based on the work of Deleuze and Guattari and more recently Dave Cormier, who I mentioned earlier on, uh, the idea that um, there's a nomadic nature to our knowledge and certainly ident identities. We, we tend to wander around there. We, we make our way through the web and we get distracted very easily by clicking on things that we didn't expect to see. But ultimately, almost by serendipity, by happy accident, we tend to learn stuff we didn't expect to learn. So in effect, um, uh, learning on the web and learning through these um, rhizomatic routes where there is no center and no boundary to what we do, I think that's an ultimately quite powerful idea. So that's a, a very postmodernist idea, but I, I think uh, it's something that we can all kind of think about and come to terms with. And it's 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 really, I, I suppose, um, about not really having any exit points. We we continue to learn. It's an ongoing process. It's never finished. The paint is always wet, and uh, there are always gateways to open, more gateways to to go through. Uh, I also um, find that that's important when we talk about um, MOOCs because the, the CMOOCs, the original CMOOCs, before, before the big companies like edX and, and um, Coursera came in and took, took over and they became XMOOCs, they, when they were CMOOCs, um, and I, I was involved in some of the original ones back in uh, the early 2000s, um, they, they, they were really kind of quite open and quite open to interpretation, open to negotiation. Students did basically what they wanted with the material. They made of it what they wanted and created what they wanted, and they were assessed how they wanted as well. So it wasn't just the same time, you know, different time and different place. It was also different mode and different as assessment as well, which was very powerful. Uh, but no, um, I'm seeing a new type of blended learning emerging, um, which I suppose we could call supplemental uh, blended learning, where students are, are being involved in traditional courses, but then they're going off and taking small MOOCs or spooks, I think they're called now, you know, small specialist MOOCs um, to supplement the learning on the traditional course that they're um, learning about. And I think that's an interesting development as well. And I think there's going to be quite a, a, a market for small, um, you know, maybe you know, one session MOOCs, two session MOOCs in the future because of that. Now, this former president here said it all. He said, I not only use all the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. And that is the basis behind connectivism. The basis behind um, most of the theories we're talking about now is that we connect with people and we connect with ideas and we, we even store our knowledge with them. Um, I'll tell you a story about, um, well, in fact, I could tell you several stories, but, but one of my stories is, is that um, I was in, in front of a group of students once and I didn't know the answer to a question. So I said, let me, let me, um, tweet it out and so I, I used Twitter and I tweeted it out and within about five minutes I had three great answers back from real experts in the field from somewhere else in the world and th this amazed the students because um, I said I, you know or, or I, I, I should have known that that answer but because I didn't know it at my point of need I asked for the question and, and, and somebody gave me the answer and um, so I think that's a very powerful idea that we share our knowledge and we store our knowledge in our friends and those we know about us we collect people in our social networks, in our personal learning networks. Uh, so we cloud source, we, we crowdsource our, our learning by building personal learning networks and personal learning environments. And um, I'm sure most of you are already doing that. I'm coming to the end now, just a couple more ideas for you. Stephen Johnson, a great writer, said, um, uh, this is, is, is not the wisdom of the crowd, but the wisdom of someone in the crowd it's not that the network itself is smart, it's that the individuals get smarter because they're connected to the network. So the more you get involved in networks, the more students become involved in those type of communities, the better they're going to be learning um, because they're, they're obviously bouncing ideas off everyone. Um, there is the problem of the echo chamber where you're following only people that agree with you. 
So I used to encourage my students to follow people who didn't agree with them, who took a different political or religious or, or cultural or social um, perspective to them. And that way you're going to expand through um, in different ways and, and in different um, modes. And, and one final idea for you, or question really, if you like, when we talk about connected learning, connected pedagogy, what do we mean? Do we mean that we are connected to our teachers? Do we mean that we're connected to content? Do we mean that connect, we're connected to experiences or connected to technologies, connected to um, our peers? There's a whole range of things that we could talk about in the context of blended learning. Uh, and I could also say to you, look, does blended learning actually exist? Or is it just a name we've given to something that we've been doing for, for, for centuries? And with that, I'm going to stop because I know it's nearly quarter two. And um, so there are my contact details. If you if you want to get into touch with me later on, web, my web uh, is, my website's there, my email, my blog, and also my Twitter account. Those are the main methods I use currently to communicate with. So I hope that's been interesting to you and um, all 38 of you. <laughs> and um, hopefully you've got some questions now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, really for this uh, inspiring and engaging insights uh, into what blended learning is or might be if we use it uh, properly. So, yeah, we have some a few minutes for comments, suggestions, um, questions, and or you may uh, write down in the chat. I see someone writing down there. Yep. Yeah. Azura, what are you wanting to say? Someone shy? Yeah. Ah, interesting question from Lala. What is the difference between blended learning and hybrid learning? That, that's something that I think we all need to think about. I think um, there are so many types of blended learning that I suppose we could call them hybrid learning. I, I, I Personally, I don't see much of a difference. Um, I think... Um, maybe someone else has different perspectives on this but hybrid for me means a mix of things it means blending things together so in a sense i i don't think there is much of, of a difference if, if at all uh, maybe there's a purist uh, amongst us that could could tell us if there is a distinction between the two and ignace says if a teacher is just starting with blended learning what would you suggest to start with what activity what platform well two questions there what activities i would suggest is um, particularly if you're in a traditional mode uh, of teaching, um, I would I would split up the sessions. Don't do too much teaching. Um, do a lot of facilitation. Get them doing various activities that challenge them and make them struggle. Um, problem solving exercises, exercises where they have to meet a challenge or where they have to go out and find something and bring it back. So don't keep them stuck in one space or one classroom. And um, platforms, there are so many different platforms that you could use. I, I often used to use wikis because they were open and they were really usable by anybody. Uh, people could come in and collaborate with each other or argue with each other. They could delete things and, and, and create new things. And it became a very creative space wherever they were, whether they were at home or in the classroom. We used to start the activity in the classroom and then say, okay, go off and continue it outside the classroom now. And that for me was a very powerful blend of face-to-face -face and remote, and also um, uh, you know, kind of talking about ideas together and then talking about them separately, but connected together by the technology. So wikis are quite, quite good. Karen, do you find that students are sometimes resistant to new learning and teaching approaches? Yeah, but um, that's tough, isn't it? I mean, if they're there, they're there because they want to be there. They're there because um, they're interested in getting a degree. And so therefore, they should, I think, um, trust the, the teachers, the, the lecturers, to actually create um, environments and activities and opportunities for them to learn in different ways. And um, yes, um, students used to worry about trying to come back and teach me something that I didn't know. But invariably, almost always, they would find something new that I would think, ah, haven't thought of that before. Uh, we're all learners, every single one of us. The only difference between learners and teachers is teachers are professional learners. We get paid to learn. <laughs> So how do you convince a student to take part in, um, in blended learning? Students that are very much used to the traditional teaching and feel 
it's insecure when uh, they have to take responsibility for their own learning. I'll give you a story. When I was teaching in further education many years ago, um, I was quite new to the teaching profession, but I knew that I couldn't um, lecture. Um, I, I knew that I, lecturing wasn't a very effective method for me to use. And there was one guy in the room who was an engineering teacher. They were all lecturers themselves, but they had to come in and, um, and get a, a qualification. So he knew how to lecture and how to teach. And uh, he would keep asking me questions, and I'd keep say, saying to him, Gary, go away and find out and come back and tell me next week. And he got so annoyed with me. He resisted me. He said he was going to complain about me. He said, I've paid for this course, and you're not teaching me anything. Um, and for, for five or six weeks, this went on, you know, fighting in the classroom with him, you know, arguing with him and saying, no, no, you, you, are, you know, he was arguing with me. Um, I, I want to hear from you. I want the answer now. I'm asking the question now. I want the answer now. And I would say, no, I'm not going to give you the answer. Now. Go away and struggle over it. And after about seven or eight weeks, he came back to me and he shook my hand and said, Steve, I'd like to thank you for, for persevering and, and, for, um, and for, for saying that I had to go away and find the answers for myself. He said, because I, I've never learned so much in my life. He said, I could have learned so much with you, but I've learned so much more by going away and finding out for myself. And what's more, I'm going to use that with all my students now as well. And I thought, job done. Thank you. Mike. Okay, so any more comments, suggestions, or question? We will um, go through the session, although we are really lucky because we are going to have uh, Steve again on our third day session. Okay, so Steve, thank you very much again. Uh, we will you for it on uh, Thursday. So uh, we will have a panel session then. And uh, so now I'm going to to present uh, our next speaker today, who is uh, with him. Yeah. Well, um, in this um, presentation, as uh, I said, uh, we wanted to look deeper into what blended learning is. And our second speaker is Vivi Dijkstra from Delft University of Technology uh, uh, from the Netherlands. He's a member of the Embed project of the EADTU. Hi, Vivi. And uh, they are all working uh, very hard in a project that is um, uh, named European Maturity Model for, uh, for Blended Education, the Embed project. And his training and advisor in blended learning. And uh, well, uh, we are waiting for you to present us what a bed project is and, and your work and your opinion about uh, what blended learning is. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me clearly. I will go to the presentation. Well, this presentation is about the European maturity model for blended education. Uh, my name is Wiebe Dijkstra. I work at the Delft University of Technology as an advisor and teacher on blended learning and blended education. And we as TU Delft are involved in the Embed project. Let me see. Yes. Um, Embed is a strategic partnership. And um, what we try to do is to create a maturity model on blended learning and blended education. Well, what I mean by that, I will explain it later. Uh, I think a important part of this uh, project is that it is really a partnership between different institutions in Europe. And here you can find them. Uh, so uh, EADTU is the coordinator of the project. Um, I'm here at TU Delft, but we're also collaborating with the uh, KU Leuven, Aarhus University uh, in Denmark, KU Leuven is in Belgium, DCU, Dublin City University, Tampere University of Applied Science in Finland, and uh, the University of Edinburgh. Um, well, the aim of our process is to create a reference model on blended learning and blended education. Um, this is a process, uh, this project took, started in 2017 and will be finished in 2020. And what we did in this project is first create a conceptual framework. Um, and the goal of this framework is that you as an institution or as a teacher can assess yourself in seeing how mature you are in blended learning or blended education. Uh, and I will show what that means in a, in a moment. So we uh, first developed the framework. Then we're now in the process, in the second step of developing and designing the instruments for the self-assessment. Then we have the maturity model and monitor. And next year, in 2020, we will release a MOOC 
where you can learn everything about the maturity model. So you will learn what it is and how you can work with it. And the last steps uh, is to also see if we can make an impact on yeah, European level, maybe change some policies. Um, yeah. So first, blended learning, blended education is a very fake term. I always call, call it an umbrella uh, term. So I think it's very important to, de to determine what are we blending. And it's a nice picture which has all kinds of different elements of blended learning. So on the left hand side, we have the traditional classroom and there you see a group of students who are working together. There is still some scheduling. There is a teacher explaining also some individual work. And we also have the online part. And that's now with blended learning, something which is new for teachers. So in the online part, you have online lectures, for example, videos. Teacher, uh, students will look at them, uh, will search for themselves, will share, and also online discussion and interaction and working on your own time. So blended learning is a very broad concept, um, but for this project, it was useful to make a definition. And I will go to the next page and there you will see which definitions we created. First, the blended learning. Uh, we define blended learning as learning as a result of a deliberate and integrated combination of online and face-to-face -face learning activities. So it is really about choosing as a teacher what kind of learning activities do you want and how can you integrate the online space and the face-to-face -face space in this uh, learning process. Uh, well, learning is always difficult because that takes place in the head of the students. So we also define blended teaching and that is something what the teacher or the instructor does. And we define that as designing and facilitating blended learning activity. Uh, the last is the blended education and the definition is the formal context of blended learning that is determined by policies and conditions with regard to the organization and support of blended learning so blended education is more about an institution how the institution facilitates blended learning and blended teaching if you look at uh, this pro uh, project we uh, distinguish three levels the micro level this is the micro level and this is really a course or a program level and it really has to do with the teaching of the, of the teacher and the learning by the students. Well, around this whole uh, micro level is the meso level, this is the institute. And that is, uh, you see that they, they determine the policies and also the conditions for blended education. And the last level is the macro level and that's more governmental level uh, and the impact on society. And in this presentation, I will really uh, dive into the micro level. So the course and program level and the institute level. First, I will give some examples on the micro level. Uh, so the micro level is really about a course or a program. And this is a, a model we use, which is key. Uh, and this is like a design assignment we do with teachers. Every card you see is a learning activity for the student. Uh, and the arrow you see represents the time. So in this case, uh, a student goes uh, starts this week by watching a video. He reads the material that can be just an ordinary textbook or maybe a PDF or something else. And something else, the, the student also needs to do an online quiz, uh, which relates to the video and the materials. Then when he goes to the face-to-face -face time, the teacher is there and uh, it, they will discuss the quiz in the, uh, in the classroom. So the teacher sees, okay, these topics are not read, really clear for the students. We need to discuss this more. Uh, and there is some peer instruction and that is where st uh, students uh, lecture each other on the topic. So they explain to each other how uh, so, uh, the things work. Then again, they go uh, away from the classroom. So the lecture is over. They go home or to the library and they do some calculations. They can also read a paper on a subject. And then again, in the next lecture or the face-to-face -face session, they discuss the calculations they did at home. And there is an in-depth lecture on a difficult topic. So, and this is also where you see the deliberate and the integrated um, design of learning activities, because all the things they do online, for example, the quiz, come back in the face-to-face -face time, and also the calculations come back in the face-to-face -face time. So, in this case, the online and face-to-face -face learning activities are really integrated with each other. Sometimes you see that teachers uh, really do a different face-to-face -face track and an online track, and then the students will get lost because they don't know what they need to do and how. Um, so this is an example of, of uh, designing a, a course. So this is really the, the micro the course level. And this is all so a handout I use often. And this is some inspiration for teachers on what they can do. 
because teachers, yeah, they when they were a student, they really only knew, yeah, had lectures, and they don't really know what they can do more uh, in the face-to-face -face time and also in the online space. So, for example, in the face-to-face -face time, you can still do lectures, can still be a, a useful way to transfer the knowledge. But you can all do other kinds of things. For example, a guest lecture can be here, uh, very helpful. Maybe an excursion, or maybe a classroom discussion, or maybe even a game. Um, and in the online space, you can also use videos, but for example, also the online quiz or an online brainstorm. Nowadays, we also have interactive videos and PDF uh, uh, questions where you can add, uh, for example, questions to your video or PDF. So it's also important in my role, I think, to inspire teachers what they can do. And well, the distinction is a bit, well, uh, strange because I think games can also be done in the online part. Uh, case studies can also be in the face-to-face -face part. But the, the goal of this handout is really to inspire teachers to look further uh, than what they know. So this is an example of the micro level, the course level. Then we go to the meso level, and that's the institution level. Um, and I will give one example. Uh, this is about uh, uh, um, lecture rooms or more uh, teaching spaces. What we did at the Delft University of Technology is to make uh, an inventory of what kind of teacher's room, teacher teaching rooms we need. We uh, divided it in uh, frontal teaching, and that's just the teacher-centered uh, more lecture. So you, you need a board, students sit in rows. Um, we have mixed practice. That's another one where there is some instruction, but also teachers, uh, students working groups. We have a collaboration uh, room and there is more like group work, uh, maybe uh, 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 that a teacher uh, enters the room in, 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 the face -face, in the online space via Skype. And we have two uh, rooms really for testing. So there are more exam rooms. So the, the written exams, but also the digital exams. And uh, we also set, uh, made a nice table. And there you can see also we divided it uh, in the different uh, sizes of the students. So if you have really 150 or 350 students or more, the mixed practice is a bit difficult to achieve. And we used this cookbook also to design new uh, teaching rooms. For example, this is our new educational building Pulse, and it, ha it has a lot of different setups. Um, I will go to the next page. I really like this room. This is really a, a terrace space. So this is really for group work. Um, and in the, uh, the in the front, there's also a big screen where a teacher really can explain things. And how a teacher can use this is that he explains some things and that every level has an own teaching assistant and they walk around and help the students. There's a really lot of interaction. Uh, they're all, each space also has a nice uh, whiteboard where they can write, collaborate. Um, so in, we really use that cookbook to design our uh, learning spaces. Um, then um, another example of, of uh, an institute level is also the facilities for blended learning. So we also can uh, record very nice videos for their education. And it's really easy for the uh, teachers because they can really make an appointment. They don't have to pay anything. They have a lump sum to the studio so they can make an appointment and they help them with the videos. So that's really easy for the uh, teachers to create videos. Last level. Yes, is the uh, macro level. And that's really about the uh, yeah, governmental policies. Um, in some countries, teachers get paid by, based on the hours in class. And then it becomes difficult to facilitate blended learning because if you really also want to have some self-study at home, um, it's not really an incentive for teachers to, uh, to, to yeah, do blended learning. In some countries, reducing class time is also political sensitive. Um, so that's also difficult if you want to do something with blended learning. If you can't reduce the class time, it's really not helping. And some governments, for example, Netherlands, are promoting blended learning with grant programs. So these are some examples with what governments can do or shouldn't do, which has influence on blended learning. OK, I will stop for a moment now because before we go to the conceptual framework. And are there any questions so far? No, don't think so. OK. Well, then, then the conceptual framework. As I told before, uh, the goal of the embed project is to um, create a conceptual framework for blended learning 
uh, and blended education. Um, and it's a maturity model and that it means that it measures matur maturity. Um, and one important remark is that maturity is not the same as quality. Quality is yeah, how good a course is, for example, but maturity is more, is more in the sense, um, how are you evaluating your education and how are you improving yourself and how evidence-based is everything you're doing. Um, so this maturity model focuses really on the maturity and not quality. So that's an important distinction. Uh, and this is a nice quote. Maturity is the measurement of the ability of an organization to continuously improve in a particular discipline. So the maturity model for blended learning and education is also really about continuous improvement. So you could have a really mature blended learning course with low quality. I don't think it will happen often, but it is possible. Um, so how, yeah, how will it look? Um, we divided three uh, levels in the maturity model. We have the uh, course level, the program level and the institution level. And for each level, we defined a couple of dimensions which are important for blended education. For example, in the institution level, we have, I think, eight dimensions. I will show them later. Um, and for each dimension, we also uh, uh, defined indicators. So in this example, we have the dimension institutional support. And the definition is the manner in which an institution supports teachers and students blended learning activities. Um, and then what you can do with this is uh, for each level, you can like self assess yourself and see in which level am I as an institution. For example, if you are at hoc level, level one, there is very limited support for blended learning and teaching and aimed at the individual teaching uh, staff and students. And what you see when, when institutions are not really mature in blended learning, for example, there are some people who know something about blended learning activities or how they can create, um, uh, how they can create videos but it's not widely spread in the university. You really need to know that guy who can help you. But when you are more uh, mature, for example, level two consolidated, there is uh, dedicated support for blended uh, learning and teaching, and it is available for all teachers, students, and departments. So there is really a desk where you can go if you need support for blended learning. And if you are, if you are the highest maturity, then we think the support for blended learning and teaching is a, the standard support service by the institution. So if you contact support, they can help you with blended learning. You don't need to go to a special desk, but all the expertise is really in the uh, support department or maybe at the faculty. Um, and an other important thing is that continuous quality improvement is deliberately embedded in order to improve the support for blended learning. So there you see also see the maturity. It's really about uh, continuously improving yourself, evaluating yourself, and see if you can uh, improve yourself. One important remark, everything I tell in this presentation is work in progress. Um, in this uh, project, uh, uh, we are almost done with the definite uh, maturity model. What we did is we uh, uh, created the model based on literature research and interviews by the institutions, uh, by, by interviews by the partners. And after that, we're validating it with experts on blended learning in Europe. And we're now in the process of validating this process, uh, this model, and it's almost done. But there are, can be still some changes, but I don't think it will be that many. So now what I would like to do is go in each level, uh, the course level, program level, and uh, institution level, and explain uh, which dimensions we uh, identified. So first, the course level. Uh, dimensions we identified. So first of all, the selection of blended learning activities and their sequence, then the se selection of blended learning tools, course flexibility, and that's really about uh, are your students able to study on their own pace, their own time. Uh, the next one is course interaction, and that's really about is there interaction in the course and not only content uh, student interaction, but also uh, student student interaction or maybe teacher student interaction. And the last three, uh, the student learning, study load and inclusiveness is really about um, how easy is it for students to study. Uh, for example, what you see in study load sometimes is that uh, when, uh, is, when a teacher is not really mature, they don't really know how much time students spend on their course. They don't, don't really calculate how much time they spend online. Um, so it's really a guessing. And if you become more mature, you really base that 
uh, on data also. So you see in the learning environment how much time do they spend on um, on really the studying. So and I will um, highlight one, and that's the study load. So that's really about how many ECTS has the course, and 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 do they really do the students really spend that much time on the course? But also calculate the online and the face-to-face -face activities. So some institution has some have some nice tools. For example, this is uh, Let's Rope University, and there they have an online calculator for study load. But it can also be more basic. Another university has more guidelines on how you can calculate the study load. So if you go back to this uh, first picture. So this is uh, the course level. Um, maybe the inclusiveness is also uh, interesting. This is really about how you make sure that uh, every student feel, feels valued and that if, there are, if you are students with disabilities that they also can study. For example, in a learning environment nowadays, you can easily um, add uh, text to images for screen readers. Um, but you should, should also make sure that people, uh, students feel safe if they have an online discussion. Um, so I think that's also very important to um, yeah, take that in consideration when you're designing a course. Um, are there any questions about the course level? I don't see anything. You can still hear me? Someone is typing. Oh, what do I mean with blended learning tools? Well, these are really the tools which are used for education. So that can be the learning environment. Uh, that can also be, for example, clicker tools where students can vote on their mobile phone if a teacher has a, a question on the screen. It can all be, also be an online uh, collaboration environment like a wiki. Um, it can also be just, just PowerPoints. Um, and um, w when you are very mature in selecting blended learning tools, then you uh, know what, are, what in, the, in the lowest level of maturity is really what your institution offers. And if you come further on, you really decide, OK, what kind of tools do we need to, to really um, teach the subject the best? Some other questions? How wouldn't be student learning the main goal? Yes, absolutely. Um, in this case, we define student learning uh, more as um, in, in, in uh, what extent do teachers take um, uh, self-regulated learning of students in control? When you have uh, blended learning, you see that students mostly do more uh, studying self-paced uh, on their own time in their own space. But one important thing is also that students are able to self-regulate their learning. I think with blended learning, that's more important uh, than with just traditional uh, lectures where every uh, every week a teacher well explains how the book is working and students go home, do the assignments. Uh, so the student, everything is focused on the student learning, uh, but student learning uh, is more about self-regulated uh, regulation learning skills of the students. That's a personal um I don't know what you mean by the personal characteristics well maybe personality in a psychological language well maybe it's an idea that i um I think this is maybe a bit too in-depth for now, but um, I will make sure that if the um, maturity model is ready, you will also uh, get a copy and then you can look at it and, and um, see if it fits um, your case. Okay, this was the uh, course level. Now we're going to the program level. And there um, we uh, uh, defined uh, seven dimensions. The first is the uh, course design process. Um, and that consists of uh, the program coherence and the alignment and coherence of blended learning tools. And program coherence is more about if you have several courses, how, they, how are they aligned? Um, and also, for example, if you have a first year's bachelor's course or a master course, 
um, the level of, of uh, um, for example, self-study can can increase if you are have more master students than, than bachelor students. So it's really about the alignment. The alignment and coherence blended learning tool is more that if you have a, 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 a program and every course use different tools, they're not really aligned. So then you really, as a program, need to look more in what kind of tools do the students really need. Maybe we can choose one assessment tool and not use seven of them. Uh, and maybe also look at what is the uh, industry tools and should we include that in um, the program. Then the program flexibility, and this is more uh, also about the, the flexibility for students. And I will, I think, explain that in the next slide. Yes. Uh, program modularity. That is more if um, in, in what extent is it possible to reuse uh, several parts of your program? Uh, we have a big uh, math, blended math program at the TU Delft, and they uh, offer all the first and second year bachelor math courses. It's t uh, taught by the uh, teachers from the math department, and they use a lot of videos. And what they always do when they create a new video is see, do we already have such a video? And if not, how can we make it general enough that maybe also other courses can use it? So um, we think that uh, uh, the, the maturity, if you really think about how you can reuse materials, it's, uh, you are more mature because it saves time, money, effort. Um, and then we have the uh, program experience. It's again, the student learning, the uh, study load and the inclusiveness. And these are more focused on uh, are they aligned within the whole program? And I will elaborate a bit more on program flexibility. So maybe it's possible for your st uh, students to select a couple of courses in the program they want to do. Or maybe they can choose for the mode of delivery if they want to do an online course, a face-to-face -face course, or a blended course. Um, maybe a program offers part-time studying or full-time studying. Or maybe students can do something in other universities. And I will give some examples. The first picture is uh, of TU Delft, and uh, we offer a lot of tracks. So this is a specialization in a master program. So this is really an option for, uh, for the uh, students to really specialize themselves. So this is some program flexibility. The other example also is of the University uh, of uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. And there they offer master programs in a full-time variant or a part-time uh, option. Another example, uh, we also at TU Delft have an uh, exchange program with other university. Uh, and what it means is that students can fo follow MOOCs, uh, Massive Open Online Course for other universities. They will also do it, so an assessment. And um, they uh, uh, pass the course, they will get credits for the MOOCs. So this makes it possible for students to follow courses we don't offer at TU Delft, but they offer, are offered at other university, universities. So this uh, makes it uh, yeah, possible for students to have a lot more flexibility. Um, yeah, that's I think the most important about the uh, program level. Some questions, or can we move on to the institution level? I will get a sip of water. It's very warm. Yeah. Okay, the institution level. This is really about an institution like a university, a university of applied science, but in some cases it can also be like a, a faculty of, or a department of an institution. It really depends how much well power they have or how much how uh, centralized the university institution is. Uh, we have eight dimensions. So the institutional support, and this is really about uh, support for blended education. This means are there facilities, for example, to record videos? Is there an online learning environment? Uh, is there a support desk, for example, for students, but also for teachers? Uh, then we have the institutional strategy. So if an institution does not have a strategy on blended learning, well, nothing really will happen. So there should be a strategy on blended uh, learning or education. Next one is sharing entities, and that is really uh, about the teachers or educators uh, who are possible to share uh, their best practices. So maybe there is this lunch lecture, for example, where teachers explain what they did in education and how it worked and how other teachers can Uh, teachers who all do design education come together from all faculties and discuss what they're doing and how they can collaborate with each other. The next one is uh, personal development. 
And this is really about are your uh, is your staff able to uh, develop themselves? So if they d uh, didn't do anything with blended learning, it's important that there are perhaps some courses or maybe some courses on how to create videos or maybe a workshop on how to use a, a, like a digital uh, board. Next one is quality assurance. It's also important to have that in place. And I think quality assurance for blended learning is also um, really thinking about not only what is in the face-to-face, -face, but also in the online space. Um, governance, that is really how you make sure that the strategy, the blended strategy also uh, is applied in all the faculties and, uh, in the, um, and uh, that the teachers know what they need to do. Finances is also important. So if there is no money, nothing will happen. Um, and that means that there should be money, for example, for the support, the institutional support, but also maybe some grants uh, for, for, uh, for incentives for teachers that they can uh, improve themselves. Um, uh, what we now have is a big blended learning project, uh, which there, where there is some uh, finance, I think not that much like a thousand euros and one learning developer like myself um, for a faculty to uh, improve, to, to uh, redesign three courses. And we really do that on all the eight faculties. So in this year, 24 courses are really uh, being blended. So th there is some money and, and uh, it's used in this case also to uh, realize uh, blended learning. And the last one is the facilities. And this really, um, oh, I, uh, this is really is there, uh, some recording space. And I think I mixed the institutional support and the facilities. Uh, I mix them around. Uh, the facilities really are the, is the recording uh, space. Is the are the, the teaching rooms are they equipped for, for example to do more collaboration? Um, that's very important. And institutional support really. Is to sign their education? Is there someone to help them? And I will highlight the, the personal development. So it's really about continuous professional development. So if the teacher uh, really wants to continue to develop himself, is there something? Uh, also recognition for the teachers. Uh, and they should be able to uh, acquire new skills. Uh, now, since I think two years, the teaching academy, and this is really a place for teachers where they can innovate, uh, where they can come together. We also have a physical space, which is called the teaching lab. And this is really a space for teachers. Students are not allowed and they can really come in there and learn and, and exchange. So the lunch lectures are held here. If there are training or workshops, it will also be here in this room. Uh, there are uh, uh, like uh, every uh, month there are, is a, a, a possibility to have drinks with each other. And what really helps there is really the best coffee on campus for teachers and that really helps. So they can also just walk in, have a nice cup of coffee, read a, 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 a educational related magazine or just work and then um, um, uh, yeah, improve their education. Um, there is also some, some uh, uh, really innovative uh, uh, teaching tools. For example, we have a new Reva interactive whiteboard where you can walk and, and uh, um, where you can have like an interactive uh, post-it notes. You can swipe them around. It's really uh, fun and really uh, uh, easy to use. Um, and we also offer that in the teaching lab. So teachers really can try new things and um, uh, improve their education. Um, we have the education in the spotlight program where teachers are really uh, set in the spotlight. Uh, so we have the eat and meet lunch lectures. We have a yearly teacher in the spotlight award for the best teacher and also the innovative uh, teaching talent, talent. And we also have the education fellows. And this is also some recognition for teachers who really did do, uh, do something great. And they are appointed for uh, two years and they get a grant of 50,000 euros to spend on their education. And one part of the, the fellowship is that, that they also should go into the faculties and in the university and explain what they did and inspire new teach, uh, other teachers. So it's really about appreciation for the teachers, sharing knowledge, uh, making sure that um, um, yeah, uh, education is valued. So in that case, um, we also offer different workshops, for example, uh, augmented the virtual reality, but also on blended, blending your education, uh, also teaching an online course. Uh, do-it-yourself video is also very popular and there they learn how they can uh, create videos themselves. Uh, also presenting on the camera. Um, so these are some examples on the uh, professional development. 
and um, I think the teaching lab is the, the this nice building is a bit of um, professional development, but also sharing in communities. Um, so some things come, uh, yeah, are used in in different dimensions. Um, so almost the end. So what will you be able to do with the uh, uh, this uh, maturity model? Well, the main goal of this maturity model to have a self-assessment tool so that you as a teacher or as an institution can see how are we doing on blended learning and where can we improve ourselves. So uh, in the end, there will be graphs like this if you fill in the tool uh, and it will also give some uh, guidelines and, and, and tips and tricks on how you can improve yourselves. For example, uh, for the institution support uh, in the institution level, if you don't score that high on facilities, be some tips on how you can improve this. For the selection bl uh, of blended learning activities and sequence, if you don't score that high, there will be some tips on how you can do that. For example, users model like the wave or another time model. So the aim of this model, is, of this this maturity model, is not to judge you, but really to help you as a teacher or an institution to prove yourself and 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 uh, continuous uh, be better in blended uh, learning and education. So this is my last slide. If you want to know more about the project, go to uh, embed.eatu.eu. And if you want to get in contact with me, my contact information is also here. Um, well, the, the, as I told before, the model is not finished yet. I think it will be um, in, well, by the end of August, it will be definite because now the experts in Europe are, uh, are yeah, validating the, the, the model. Um, but I think it will be very useful. I hope so. So if you have any other questions, please uh, let me know. An overall institution. Um, well, the first one, um, what we see now is that uh, for uh, about the, the, the content and modded uh, methods, we have a lot of uh, um, uh, tools which are offered by the university. And sometimes what we do is uh, if a, a, an of a faculty needs a new tool and they see one, they have a pilot in that uh, faculty. And then we will see if we can scale that pilot up. For example, we have a tool which is called Project Campus and that is for design education. So it started in the faculty of engineering, but now it's also used in the faculty of architecture. Um, so we have some uh, um, educational uh, uh, program managers. Um, I think those are the titles of the people who uh, really uh, uh, do the educational project. Um, uh, can skill up those uh, uh, requests. So there is a, a offered by the university for the whole university, and sometimes there is a pilot, and then we will see if there is more interest in it, and then we will. Uh, um, yeah, uh, try to uh, implement in the whole of the university. But nowadays with the GDPR, it is more difficult to do things with new tools. So we're still struggling with that, but we try to do it, um, uh, yeah, try to help the teachers uh, as best as possible. Um, are there any publications about the model? Um, not yet. I think the first uh, this 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 project consists of three intellectual outputs. The first one is really a literature study and interviews in the uh, partner universities, and I think that will be published in a couple of weeks. Um, and the second part, this is what uh, we are doing, is to validate the maturity model with the experts in Europe, and also developing the assessment methods. And I think we have the first results in uh, September, and then we will also publish it on the website. And then in, in, in uh, next year, in 2020, in February or March, the MOOC will be released. And there you can learn how to use the model and implement. Okay, uh, I'm wondering if any aspect of the blend is with the teacher face-to-face -face and without the teacher online. Um, I think this comes back to the wave. Um, yeah, that's a bit difficult and I all um, bit, I'm a bit hesitant with the uh, the online and face-to-face -face terminology because online you can also have a teacher presence, for example, a meeting or participating in a discussion, and face-to-face -face you can also have something without the teacher presence. Um, we use the terms online and face-to-face -face because it's well, well recognized. Um, 
And in the end, what I always tell my teachers is not really about blended learning. It is creating the best course possible. And I think technology often can help, but it shouldn't be the, 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 the goal to add as much technology as possible. To, but really, it comes down to look at your learning objectives, look at what kind of activities fit those, and also how can you assess those. Um, and, and usually this is a handout I use in, in, in uh, uh, design sessions and then in the discussions, we really see what the teachers really want and what really fits their course. So don't um, focus too much on online or face-to-face -face part, but uh, really see it as a tool to have a discussion on what kind of education you like. Um, can face-to-face -face learning be totally replaced by online learning and still achieve the same learning outcomes? Um, I think it can be possible. Um, I think the face-to-face -face, uh, still has some added value. Uh, for example, just, just a community of, of other students you learn, uh, you can collaborate. I, I think it's still easier to collaborate face-to-face -face than uh, online. Well, in this case, in the case of a webinar, it's very easy to do a webinar. But I think the discussion in this case also would be better if we are online to over one room. Um, what I try to do with blended learning, really see what is the added value of the teacher time. I ask my teach, uh, student, uh, I ask the teachers, what is the added value? And usually that's not in the lecture, but more in the discussion and the interaction. So we really try to focus on that in the face to face time. Um, but still, I think you can do a lot online. I think also the MOOCs uh, uh, showed that, uh, and also uh, uh, more and more. For example, now there is are also even uh, there are even all whole online academic uh, master courses online uh, programs online. So it's possible. Um, but I think sometimes just a face to face meeting is easier to communicate. But it's possible. But it, I think it really um, it, you really uh, ask a lot also of your students. So you. As a student, you should be really focused and dedicated to uh, complete an online course. For example, I did a lot of MOOCs and I only finished one because, yeah, it really takes a lot of time and you really have to take uh, need that time. So I think it's possible, but I think still face-to-face uh, -face has, uh, has a place in education. Let's see. Um... Now, there are a range of uh, literature over the last 50 years. There is no significant difference between outcomes uh, of this. I think it's true. And also, if you see the the, the, the the research by Meyer, you see that it really doesn't depend on which way you offer the content, if it's by video or by book or maybe by a lecture. Um, but I think in the face-to-face -face time, it's more the added values, I think also more in community building. Um, learning from each other with each other, and it can also be online. For example, Google Docs is very nice software to do that. Um, so it can be possible, but I think, especially if you have 80 or 18 or 19 year old students, I think it can really help to have them also in the face to face time. Some to uh, to to uh, yeah, also motivate them and see how how they're doing education what's going on and those kinds of things. Okay, so we have reached uh, our the, well the end of the session. It's been a, a great session, I think. As you can see, there are still so many things to have to be discussed, and uh, well, uh, let's see what happens on the third day, where we we will have more time for discuss about all these things and different perspectives about what blended learning is and this difference between blended learning, face to face, or online learning. And thank you very much Wave, for your presentation. To, for having given us uh, this uh, overview, interesting overview of the, uh, the Embed project. I think it's a very good project to guide uh, universities in the, this transition to other types of modalities of teaching and learning. Uh, what I was asking is uh, about this uh, student learning perspective is if it was that um, you were measuring uh, at, um, to what extent a program promotes uh, self-regulated learning. If Is this the uh, indicator you are measuring there? there. But oh, never mind, I, I, will, I will go through the documents to see what you have explained to us. And um, again, I want to, to thank very much to Steve and to Will for uh, their two talks today. Uh, let me come back again to this. Um, 
to this slide to uh, remind you that tomorrow we will have uh, the good practices in blended learning session with two, two uh, four contributions from different uh, parts of Europe with uh, Spain and Portugal and Turkey uh, experiences. So um, I hope to see you all tomorrow and of course uh, on the third day. And uh, thank you very much to you all for being with us uh, in this, um, this afternoon, in this first day of our Blended Learning Week. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.